on YouTube. So please give me a second until it starts. Yes, there we are. Um, welcome everyone. Welcome uh, to our last session of the Autumn School Planning and Designing for the Just Transition. Uh, we have a really uh, fun uh, night or evening or afternoon, wherever you are, uh, prepared for you. I am going to give a, a short lecture. We are going to have um, a speaker, uh, Pritika. Uh, she, I'm not sure she is in the room already, but I, I just sent her uh, the link to, <laughs> to the meeting again. Uh, I'm here, Roberto. Oh, there Hi. you are. <laughs> There she is, there she is. She, uh, so Pritika is going to uh, present uh, her graduation project to us. And the idea behind it is that you see how uh, we can use some of the ideas we discussed during the summer, the autumn school in a project, right? So it's really interesting. I'm going to introduce Pritika a little bit later uh, properly, right? You also had the haircut, Pritika, by the way. Um, <clears throat> And then Carissa is going to give us a lecture about particip participatory methods, digital per participatory methods. And she is going to demonstrate with us, we are going to participate in something that Carissa has prepared for us for 15 minutes. And then we are going to, to stop, uh, to have a plenary in which we will discuss. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, what did you find? Did you learn anything? Are you happy? Are you unhappy? You can tell us uh, a few things. Without further ado, I'm just going to um, share my screen again. And I am going to start, so you can see my screen, right? And I'm going to start with the, uh, the, the thing that we did, we did, um, Last time in which I asked you guys to tell me who are your heroes. And of course, this is a super interesting um, exercise. We always have very, very interesting results. And we collected um, a total of 187 names. Of course, um, many of them are repeated. They're mentioned several times, like Oprah Winfrey, uh, myself, my parents, uh, Michelle Obama is quite popular, and so on. So what I want to highlight from this exercise is that when I was trying to, to find out who was who, um, because of course in the exercise you tell us the name, but you don't say who that person is, right? And some of them are not super famous. So I found a lot of um, something slash activist. So many times we had somebody who is an architect or an artist or a sportswoman or a sportsman slash activist. So a lot of the people you guys mentioned last uh, week are um, activists. So that makes me think that, wow, uh, we need more activists. We need more people that are activists to in, uh, inspire you. At the same time, I have to say most of the people you guys mentioned were male, right? 60, almost 60% 60 were male, 35% uh, were female, and we have a few collectives. So, uh, you know, like you, people mentioned an office or a group of people, so they don't have a specific gender uh, or it was neutral. So myself, I didn't know if myself was, was male or female or indeterminate, right? So, but this is uh, interesting that a lot of your heroes are, are male, I would say. Another interesting um, conclusion is that uh, many of your heroes come from Europe. 32% uh, of them come from Europe, 27% come from North America. Then we had 16% from Africa, 16%, uh, uh, eight, eight points, sorry. 8.6% from Africa, 86 from Latin America, 86 they didn't have an origin or they were not from a specific country and so on. Uh, only 5.9 were from the MENA region, so the Middle East and the North Africa, right? East Asia, very little. 
So this also makes me think like uh, all, almost all our heroes are from North America or Europe. And I think that's a bit worrying. <laughs> it's a bit, uh, we should talk about that, I think. And we should, uh, we should try to understand why our heroes are all European and North American. I think that's not correct. Like I, I was expecting to see, and I did see quite a few names from Africa. And I was a bit surprised again to see so many politicians. So there are many uh, African politicians that people think are heroes. Um, that's not the case um, in, in Europe so much. Okay, let me go to my, to my lecture. And today we are going to talk about just democracy. And there is a little, um, a little game that I play. And this example comes from a book called The Idea of Justice written by this brilliant, brilliant man called Amartya Sen. Amartya Sen is an, is an Indian born um, philosopher and economist who won a Nobel Prize for economy, right? He's from India, but he works currently in the United States. He wrote this book, The Idea of Justice. And in this book, he has this example. We have three kids uh, walking down the street and there is a flute on the, on, the, on the ground. And we need to decide to whom are we going to give that flute, right? And uh, well, uh, you are going to help me decide to whom uh, am I going to give the flute. Uh, we have a, a little poll you're going to, to answer at the end, but we need to, answer, to listen to the arguments of, of the kids. So Ibrahim, and you have to assume everything that the kids tell us, it's, it's true, right? So it's, it's, they're, they're always telling the truth. So Ibrahim says, well, I'm the only one who knows how to play the flute. I can make the best use of it. So maybe we should give Ibrahim the flute, don't you think? If he is the only one who knows how to play it, the others don't. Well, Latoya, says, I am the poorest of us and I don't have any toys. The flute will make me happier. The two other kids, they have lots and lots and lots of toys, both Ibrahim and Laura. And therefore, uh, well, getting the flute won't make so much of a difference to them, but it will make a big difference to Latoya. Maybe we should give her the flute. Laura says, I have worked very hard to buy this flute. Just when I wish to enjoy it, you want to take it away from me. So for many of you that's settled, well, you know, it's hers. She owns it, she bought it with her money. It's hers, there is no, there is no discussion. And indeed in many countries, property rights are very, very important. And many times they override everything. But in other countries, actually, there is the, uh, a preoccupation for um, an utilitarian approach in which we are more concerned about the, the good of the majority. So it's all about uh, making most people happier with what we have, right? And this is called a utilitarian approach. In other countries or in other societies, we have uh, what we call economic egalitarianism in which the resources available need to be um, more or less equally distributed among everybody. So we have a kind of, um, you know, a playing field where everybody receives the same amount of resources. And finally, we also have what we call libertarianism in which, uh, well, uh, property rights are really the, the ultimate um, idea, right? So, before we discuss further, let me see. I will launch the poll. Who? Uh, who should we give the flute to? It's very funny to see things changing, right? So uh, I can already see that not a lot of you are utilitarians. It's so hard. 
it's hard. <laughs> yeah. It's hard, right? Uh, let's let's um, really understand that um, you know Laura and my brain they have a lot of toys. Uh, Latoya doesn't have any toys, but of course uh, Laura uh, bought the flute, so it's hers. Okay, look, uh, we have uh, very good. We have eighty people voted, so seven seventy three percent. Oh, oh, where is it? So still, uh, I think uh, many people here um, feel that it would be more fair to give the flute to Latoya, 49%, almost half of us, right? Whereas 30% uh, said, no, wow, it's Laura, so it's Laura's, right? And Ibrahim uh, gets 21%. Okay, well, that's interesting. Uh, I don't have an answer to you. Uh, Oops, how do I get this out of my frame now? <laughs> ah, Jesus. Wait a minute, guys. Yes. So again, um, uh, I just want to repeat utilitarians, egalitarians, and libertarians, right? The utilitarians are concerned about the effects of the actions of, and the egalitarians about equity of opportunity, fair redistribution, and, uh, and, uh, the, uh, and the um, libertarians are concerned about merit and hard work and also freedom from oppression. And the libertarians, it's funny because they are very concerned about oppression from the government. They want to be free to be entrepreneurs and they want to be free to own stuff and to make profit. Whereas uh, the egalitarians, they are more concerned of, okay, we have a limited amount of resources. How are we going to distribute it? And Ibrahim is a utilitarian because you could argue, okay, if we give the, the flute to Ibrahim and he plays, everybody will benefit, right? Uh, so there is no right answer. What I want to argue with this slide is that people have very different concepts of justice. Everybody wants justice, we feel justice. It's very, very important for us, but everybody has a different conception. And justice is at the core of sustainability. As I said in other, in other uh, classes, really uh, justice underscores uh, sustainability. It underscores the political and economic structures that support environmental sustainability and life in our planet. So if we don't have justice, it's very difficult to have real sustainability. Um, it's very difficult to preserve the planet if people are dying of hunger somewhere. How do you justify things? How do you... Uh, implement the policies? How do you make people uh, do what they are expected to do, right? So justice underscores social sustainability. It's really the base of sustainability. And it's more than the moral imperative. So we all have this moral imperative where we say, we want, I want to achieve justice. That's really important for me because I, it's really, strange how we feel when something is unjust. And uh, in the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, you have this motto, leave no one behind and so on, right? So that's very important, but it's not all. Justice is all, also important for the acceptability, the support, the compliance, the suitability, and the coordination of the policy you need to implement. So if, you, if we want to be sustainable or the design, right? I'm talking about policy, but I, I mean also design. Uh, if you don't have justice, you don't, people don't accept your policy or your design. They don't support it. They don't comply with it. Uh, your design is probably not suitable. And there is very difficult coordination because the actors uh, you know, the actors in this um, uh, thing, they, they don't comply. They don't want to, to comply. So it's difficult to coordinate. So the transition that we are talking about is urgent. We know that, but is it fair? Uh, I already showed this slide to you before. 
So we are talking about two concepts. One is about truth and the other is justice. So truth concerns validation, whether a policy or a design is valid. Uh, it depends on whether it's based on, um, on research, on science, on facts, and not on poli politicians' crazy ideas, for example. And justice determines uh, acceptability. Uh, both justice and truth contribute to the formation of a democratic public sphere. So uh, Greta, our friend Greta always tells us, science and democracy are strongly interlinked as they are both built on freedom of speech, independence, facts, and transparency. If you don't respect democracy, then you probably won't respect science. And if you don't respect science, then you probably won't respect democracy. Why is this important for us? Because as planners and designers, we need to decide to whom we are going to, to give the flutes of our cities. And we have to decide how things are going to be, um, yes, how things are going to be distributed and located in the city. This is called distributive justice. So justice has two dimensions, distributive, the geography of the distribution of the resources in the city. And the other, the other dimension is procedural. Who decides, how they decide, who is included in the decision. I hope this is clear. Uh, if not, please let me know. I can kind of see the, yeah, I can see the chat. So to help us decide, uh, there are three women I really would love you to read and to pay attention to. The first one is Eleanor Ostrom. Uh, she won a Nobel Prize as well. The first woman who won a Nobel Prize for economics. Patsy Healy, British planner, and Judith Eames, American planner. So Eleanor is American, Patsy. Uh, so I was complaining that all our heroes are European or North American, and I'm using three uh, women who are from Europe and North America. So sorry for that. Eleanor Ostrom, she studied how uh, the traditional peoples, so indigenous peoples, the First Nations, and in this case, we are looking at the wonderful um, Australian Aborigines, whom she also studied. She discovered that they are able to manage their resources in very uh, fair ways, and they are able to do things in a way that the resources are preserved. So they don't, uh, the resources don't, um, you know, they don't, uh, are not exhausted. Right now we are living a lot of exhaustion of resources. So a lot of uh, the indig in indigenous peoples or the first peoples who were there before colonization, they are able to think about the distribution of, of resources in a much better way than we can. And she discovered three, uh, a few uh, lessons that we should look at. She discovered that communication needs to be symmetric so that everybody needs to have an opportunity to speak and to make their minds known, to make their opinions known, to make their needs and wishes known. The second thing is subsidiarity. And that's a funny English word. It means that decisions should be taken at the lowest level where they have an effect. So if we are talking about uh, neighborhood planning and neighborhood design, maybe the decisions should be taken at the neighborhood level and not at the national level, because at the national level, people don't see the problems that we have in our neighborhoods. And the last thing that she says is that we need polycentric, uh, we need polycentric uh, governance, which means what? That we have decisions being taken by different groups uh, and these different groups, sometimes they are a little bit in disagreement with each other. And they will kind of fight a little bit, not fight, fight, but they will, you know, discuss. And then by doing that, they will achieve better results. And uh, uh, yeah, that's amazing because uh, Patsy Healy and Judith Eanes, by departing from, an, they had another point of departure. So they were not looking at, at, traditional peoples, they were not looking at, at indigenous peoples, they were looking at communicative rationality. The idea that we are all communic communicative beings and we have to find decisions and find consensus 
um, and arrive at some, uh, at some uh, results through communication. And therefore we have what we call communicative planning in which um, the emphasis is on the participation of all members of a community, including those whose voices are silent or whose knowledge is considered unimportant, which means what? In many places, uh, women are silent and they don't participate and they don't have um, knowledge that is considered unimportant because, you know, uh, you know, we have all these planners and they're generally men and they're generally, you know, I know everything and I know what's best for the city. So that's a challenge for you. How do you, with your specialization and your education, can make people participate? And um, it's also, she says, about reconstructing the meaning of a democratic practice based on a uh, more, uh, more uh, practices of inclusionary argumentation. So we should really invite people to participate in the planning process. We should really bring them in. It's not enough to say, oh, you know, whoever wants to say something, you can say something. That's not enough. We need to bring them in. And um, Doreen Massey, another British uh, geographer says, well, the space of the city is the ideal place for this to happen, because that's the place where we really need to live together. Um, we occupy the same spaces. We need the same resources. So how are we going to decide? How are we going to live together? And this is important because, um, for example, um, you may think that children don't have any relevant knowledge for the city or for planning or for design, but actually children know, know how to play. So we should ask them, we should include children and we should kind of make them participate so that, uh, so that the, we can deliver uh, cities that are good for children. Um, Susan Feinstein, another uh, American uh, urbanist, and uh, uh, she says that, um, we need to plan our cities from the point of view of the most vulnerable. If the city is good for the elderly, for the children, for the uh, people with um, you know, mobility issues and so on, then the city will be good for everyone. I think it's a good idea that we use, I had a teacher in my university and he always used to tell us um, when we were designing, he would say, Think about the old lady, think about the old lady. And now I really understand what he meant. If we th always think about the old lady using our designs, maybe we are designing uh, for everybody, right? Yeah, polycentric as network uh, governance, Carla is saying, exactly. Um, they, these are different things. Polycentric and network governance are very similar. Uh, polycentric is more related to this um, little competition that we have um, uh, among the stakeholders. Another thing that you will find quite a lot is multi-level governance, which means governance that happens um, in, at several levels, right? So there are several um, ways to look at that. Well, we are getting very close to the end of my lecture. I have to, uh, because we don't have time. But I just want to say the following. Um, participation and sits and participation and engagement is not easy to do. It's actually very, very difficult, time consuming. It doesn't work very well. It delays the projects. It's very difficult to, to do it. But once you do it, your project and your design is much, much better, right? In 1969, uh, Arnstein um, uh, already told us uh, about, she already, she already made this research and she found, okay, there are several kinds of participation that we see happening. And some of it is just manipulation. Some of it is just therapy. What's therapy is when you, you, listen, to the, you listen to the complaints of the, of the citizens and you say, oh, you know, I understand your problem. I'm so sorry for you but I'm not going to do anything about it. Uh, consultation and information are 
a little bit better, but they're not enough. And what she says that what we really, really need is partnership and delegate power, and finally, citizen control. So that puts us, planners and designers, in another different position. We are not the ones, you know, throwing the design or the plan on top of people, but we are just there to facilitate, to inform, to sometimes to educate people. But uh, we are listening and we are trying to design with them. It's very different than what we actually learn at the university, isn't it? Um, so I really would love for you to pay attention to this. And this, all this that I have described it goes in the direction of the right to the city, which is an idea by Henri Lefebvre. Uh, so if you can buy the book, the right to the, the, the right to the city from 1968, it's super nice. Um, or if you can find it, find it in your library, I think it's, it's really worth it. And um, what Lefebvre is saying is that the right to the city is the right to shape your living environment to your needs and desires, the right to participate in the governance of the city. So we as planners and designers, we should facilitate, uh, enable people to access their rights to the city and to participate in the governance of the city, right? Uh, for my Brazilian friends, uh, I know that there are quite a few Brazilians in the room. Um, the right to the city is enshrined in our uh, constitution and in our um, super nice uh, national urban policy called uh, the city statute. So Brazil has a, um, a national urban policy that is there to guide urban development everywhere. And these ideas are very much in there. So it's super nice. We have the good instruments, we just need, uh, we just need the, the, the right people to implement them. So my question is who does, does the city belong to, right? Uh, without further ado, thanks so much guys uh, for listening to me. I hope I was not too boring. I will stop sharing and I have to give, oh, we are 100. I will stop sharing. I'll give, if there are any questions, we can take a one or two questions just for now. Where, where is, I can't see Pritika. Pritika, can you say something again so you come up? Hey. Hi, hi, there you are. Yeah, if you say something, then I can see you. Um, so I made you co-host. Uh, so let me let me uh, explain who Pritika is. Pritika is an architect and designer from from India. She is now um, she is now working in Rotterdam as a as a designer, right? Uh, what's the name of the office? Sorry, uh, it's the Zwartehond. The Zwartehond. So Zwartehond means the black dog in in Dutch, and it's the name of a very famous design. Uh, uh, group. Uh, and Kritika did her uh, uh, graduation with us at TU Delft. And now uh, the floor is yours, uh, Kritika, to present your work. Okay. Thank you for the introduction, Roberto, mm -hmm. and the opportunity also to present it here. Okay. I will share my screen now. You see it, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, so today I'm going to present my uh, final thesis project, which is called Geographies of Power, about spatial dimension of energy transition, uh, how we can anticipate, plan, and design for the transition to renewable sources of energy. And more importantly, how can we ensure that it is a just transition where the benefits also filter down to the local communities? So I uh, elaborated on this by taking the case of Tamil Nadu, India. That's where I'm from. Um, so first I will go into um, the problem at hand and the multidimensional analysis that was done within the case of Tamil Nadu. 
The conclusions from this from these analysis was the base for the energy vision 2050 and the regional design and spatial strategies elaborate on how you can achieve this vision. And then this was tested on two local uh, uh, test sites within the region of Coimbatore. Um, so to go into the problem at hand, the obvious statement here is that energy transition has an impact on space, be it the fossil fuels production or the production of renewables. It leaves very distinct and permanent marks and spatial patterns on the land. And this spatial dimension is quite important when we talk about transition specifically because renewable energy systems occupy and need much more space and also use space in a different way than compared to fossil fuel systems. Um, in this graphic, for example, you can see uh, the spatial requirement of different um, uh, types of energy production. And you really see that the renewables, hydro, solar, wind, occupy quite a lot of space in its extraction to produce the same amount of energy that um, the fossil fuel uh, uh, plants could produce, for example. So uh, the, in absolute numbers, we need more space to realize this transition. But how can we do it in a way that it doesn't lead to energy sprawl, like we have urban sprawl? And how can spatial sp planning specifically be a tool to kind of guide this transition so that the spatial requirement is managed more efficiently? Um, what I did was also to briefly look at the different um, landscapes of energy production that are there in Tamil Nadu and also some areas outside. And these landscapes of energy production, uh, these networks of distribution, um, and also the areas of consumption. So these three things together is what constitutes the typology of energy space. So within this framework, the project was an exploratory research to find new ways of studying, mapping and designing energy geographies of the future. Um, so I took the case of Tamil Nadu, India, which contributes to like more than uh, one third of India's renewable energy uh, uh, capacity as of now. And all of this was started in the 1980s. So there's been quite a lot of strides made already in the transition to renewables. But we see that this transition continues to operate under the extractivist capitalist oriented systems of the fossil fuel era, still monopolized by private companies and supported by this rigid top-down governance system. And it's also led to this tra large scale transformation of land and acute regional inequalities when it comes to energy access. Um, so the main question here was how can regional design of these emerging energy geographies create a framework for a more just transition in Tamil Nadu? For this, I looked at three main uh, streams of analysis and design, namely the spatial dimension, the social and the governance dimension. So uh, in this part, I will elaborate a bit more on these three. Um, so first I started with understanding how does energy flow in space? So we see that, to put it very simply, that there are certain landscapes of energy production, which are uh, the energy produced there is carried through these high tension lines of different grades of uh, energy capacity to these areas of consumption, like industrial use or urban use or agricultural use. And the next step was to also map this within the context of Tamil Nadu. Like we really see that there's a concentration of renewables uh, in the West, um, also quite a lot of power plants in the coastal areas, these veins of uh, distribution lines carrying it from the production areas to the cities and villages. And um, the next step then was to also look at these energy production areas in terms of the type of energy. So I looked at four types, basically. One was solar, where uh, there is quite a lot of potential within the coastal areas and um, existing already quite a lot of solar power plants here. One of the largest in India is called the Kamuti power plant, which is in one of the drier parts of the state. Uh, wind energy, for example, is uh, currently located mostly in the Western area. And why is that? Is because 
These are the Western Guard mountain ranges. And in between these ranges, you have these wind passes, wind tunnels, where uh, uh, the building wind turbines on the path gives quite a lot of energy efficiency and output. And um, all of the biomass related uh, power plants, for example, are mostly located within agricultural areas because that agricultural residue is a raw material for bio incineration plants, for example. And uh, the fossil fuel dependent systems are mostly located in the coastal areas uh, and near uh, areas of consumption like cities. And what we see in these uh, four uh, types of energy and their spatial distribution is that there's quite a lot of link between land use and uh, what type of energy is produced in this land use. Currently, it's based Ritika. on what is, yeah? Ritika, some, somebody is asking you to repeat the research question because you said it really quickly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, the research question was to look at how uh, regional design, so designing for the whole state as a whole, um, uh, you, and using this regional design as a framework to guide uh, a just transition system. So this was kind of uh, the regional design was made up of a set of strategies, basically, that tell you how to actually do it. And um, yeah, that was the gist of it. Is that clear? Shall I continue? Yes, please, please, please. There are lots of questions, but I'm telling them that uh, okay, we are- Okay, yes, going please interrupt me with questions whenever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. and uh, um, so where was I? Yeah, so the, the key here was to look at this correlation between land use and energy production, and to look at the patterns that are causing this transformation of agricultural landscapes to wind or solar power plants, from river uh, water systems to hydropower plants, or how can urban areas also be sites for energy production, for example? So this was done by uh, using a set of like parameters to evaluate the suitability of the land for energy production based on the type of the land. To give you an example, um, urban areas could be uh, quite suited to rooftop solar energy production, for example, but not so much when you want to produce something uh, related to biomass biomass would be more suitable in areas uh, near agricultural produce. Um, barren wastelands, for example, where there's nothing happening, uh, can actually be used for large scale wind or solar energy developments instead of taking like a good fertile agricultural land for it. So these kind of uh, uh, criteria were used to grade where it is more suitable to build energy infrastructure and where it's not. So secondly, when we come to the uh, uh, social dimension of the energy transition, uh, I looked more into the access to energy, identified villages where there's not yet complete energy access or areas where higher power interruptions are reported, areas of a very high multidimensional poverty index and also to see how these factors can be can be in play when we decide where to build and who can uh, get the benefits from this transition. What was also studied was ownership of the energy infrastructure. You really see that most of the renewable energy is owned by private companies and most of the fossil fuel related, which need more investment, are um, owned by state or center uh, bodies. And the main question here was also how to shift this ownership model to uh, have uh, communities play a more role in this and to co-produce the energy with the communities instead of it happening in institutional silos. Um, for this, it's also important then to look at the governance of energy transition. How is it managed? Is that it comes down mainly to these four aspects of it, land management, the actual production of energy itself, who owns these power plants, and the uh, companies or government bodies that are in charge of the distribution, and also um, the final consumption uh, uh, measuring, that is distribution within urban consumption areas. So the primary stakeholders that are then key in this are the Tamil Nadu Electricity Board, 
the individuals and communities whose role we want to uh, uh, enlarge and the private energy companies who already have a high stake within the energy transition. Um, another uh, point that was identified was that there is a lot of gap between energy, how energy governance operates and how land use governance operates. And what is really needed is a more integrated form of looking at this that um, identifies how we can collaborate uh, between uh, government bodies that look mainly at like a zoning and spatial planning and government bodies that look at energy production and distribution. Um, to conclude the analysis, what was um, the key takeaways were that we need uh, spatial planning that enables more adaptive energy that can change based on the requirements of the future, more inclusive, more agency within the transition, and um, a collaborative energy governance that also involves the uh, governments and the local bodies together in the management of it itself. So all of these were the base for outlining the vision, energy vision like 2050 for Tamil Nadu, which envisioned like a holistic kind of transition where the constructed energy landscapes are flexible, adaptive and co-produced with the local communities in an inclusive manner. Uh, in terms of absolute numbers, it would mean that we go from a 36% renewable energy share in 2018, when I did this, <laughs> to 60% um, uh, renewable energy share in 2050, which would mean we need to build an energy capacity of 52,000 megawatts, which is quite a lot in spatial terms. So this, uh, uh, this vision statement, plus the targets, energy targets, were uh, taken as the base for outlining the regional design for the state. So the regional design basically is a set of strategies that are um, outlining how you can do something that you want and you established in the vision. So the main strategies to build were that we want to build around existing energy product, energy production sites. So not lead to urban sprawl, but really densify around existing sites. The second strategy was to create uh, combined functions with energy. So combine energy function with mobility, combine energy with waste uh, management and uh, combine energy with new construction. Um, the third strategy was to co-produce energy with the communities as much as possible in both urban and rural areas. The fourth strategy was to add to make sure that you add ecological value through the integration of landscapes wherever you're trying to produce energy. And the fourth was to also relook really at the existing fossil fuel systems. How can they adapt and still be a part of this new energy landscape that we want? And lastly, this was more of a management related strategy, but how can we uh, go past this key challenge to renewables, which is seasonal unavailability of energy. Like wind is more strong in particular seasons and solar is more strong in the summer, for example. So these changes in supply and changes in demand need to be navigated, which will also mean that certain regions are more active in energy production compared to certain regions based on change in time. Um, um, so now I'll just go very briefly into the first three. Uh, for example, when we talk about densification, right? How do we actually achieve it? Is that it could be through um, densifying and building in the gaps between existing wind turbines and new wind turbines. It could be something related to uh, building, like diversifying and building solar at the base of energy, uh, wind energy farms, for example or it could be just with updating outdated infrastructure to um, make them more efficient, uh, a high potential wind turbines, for example. And all of this can be possible also only when you upgrade the energy transmission network to take the increased load. Um, secondly, when we want to combine uh, and cross program uh, functions, 
So combining energy with the mobility that you have already spaces allocated for energy, uh, mobility infrastructure. And it's smart then to organize energy infrastructure along these corridors to combine them. And another way could be that in urban areas, the waste that is produced could be uh, uh, raw materials to produce energy. So setting up waste to energy power plants, for example. Third is to use urban infrastructure like buildings, um, gray areas, areas under flyovers to uh, set up solar panels. When we look at the third strategy related to uh, co-production of energy, um, it could it's something that happens simultaneously both in urban and rural areas and maybe in a different way in both these spaces, that the co-production in urban areas could be with the setting up of really micro solar panels, like each house taking the initiative to set up solar power plant, uh, solar panels on the roofs, or making alliances between informal settlements and energy surplus areas in urban um, uh, in cities. In rural areas, it can take the form of um, uh, encouraging subsidies to uh, generate energy within, but in combination with agriculture, and also building capac capacitation centers within every taluk and every village that can like uh, give knowledge to the people to um, or uh, support them with subsidies mainly to set up these microgrids. Um, so the regional design for the region was simply the overlay of these six strategies that together create this regional uh, uh, plan for the whole uh, state. And this uh, overlaying all of these different layers that we talk about also then lead to interesting intersections at the local level. We begin to see that when you increase the wind energy capacity, then you also increase uh, uh, the, the, the dominance of energy networks that are carrying it onwards. Or when we're proposing offshore solar energy farms in the coast, uh, political issues of um, how the seascape is managed between Tamil Nadu and Sri Lanka would probably be more in the forefront. Um, we also then see how these urban power plants that are currently existing next to urban areas, this is Chennai, for example, can they be repurposed to become bio-based um, power plants? So these things were then tested on a local site. Uh, I took the case of Tamil Nadu in India, uh, in Toimbatur uh, in Tamil Nadu, uh, to see how the larger... Uh, uh, regional vision can actually then uh, play out in this sub area. Then I took two sub sites within it. So one was really urban within Coimbatore city and one was rural in uh, Udumalpet um, to kind of test how the regional strategies actually play out on the local scale. Uh, we see that the, in the first zoom in, which I will go into the rural one, it's an existing energy hub where um, there are already these uh, um, lower capacity windmills spread across the uh, rural landscape. There's quite a lot of agriculture uh, and uh, coconut producing farms around. Uh, there's also high concentration of poultry related um, activities. So, and uh, of course, uh, settlements that are part of the landscape as well. So all of these different kinds of spaces then become testing grounds to see how we can do all of the things that we said we want to do on the state level here. That, uh, for example, how can you um, create this hybrid, diversify and create a hybrid project where wind and solar energy is happening together? How can you uh, increase the capacity of the uh, substations within the landscape to take the extra load? Or existing villages can be encouraged to set up our, uh, solar panels on their roofs or use um, part of the agricultural land to generate uh, solar energy to just manage the needs of their land and their village. Um, this can, of course, be really helped by 
uh, subsidies that that can then lead to the formation of energy cooperatives within villages that can collectively invest in these uh, projects. Uh, we also see that that the, the poultry farms, which have these, uh, this, this is how they look like. They're little uh, elongated houses, basically, with a lot of rooftop capacity to then add solar panels there. So uh, for each, the urban area and the rural area, I detailed uh, some pilot projects that could be quickly implemented to test the regional strategy, going from a landscape that looks like this to a more um, a highly programmed landscape combining wind, solar, uh, coconut uh, farm production, and so on. The second uh, area that I uh, tested the, de the design was uh, in Coimbatore, the Coimbatore city center specifically. So this is the area around the Coimbatore railway station where um, there is also this uh, quite a large lake, one of many lakes that are there in the city uh, around which the area is uh, quite underused. There, within this area is also the existing Tamil Nadu um, uh, substation for the city, basically, where the energy from outside comes in here and then it's distributed to the city. Across this road was also this informal settlement here, uh, Ukkaram, where um, uh, these were, this was also one of the areas identified in the study before as energy vulnerable uh, parts. Uh, across from this was an uh, um, educational institution uh, with large buildings, uh, big enough rooftops that can actually support solar energy generation. So if we look at how this area can transform, it can look like something like this, where uh, mobility uh, infrastructure are also fertile grounds for energy production, where energy surplus areas like the educational institution here uh, could form a partnership with informal settlements to share energy within microgrids, therefore offsetting the expense that uh, they have for uh, paying for their energy utility, for example. Uh, the uh, lake that is here, the, the energy production that can be proposed along the banks can be supplemented also with an initiative to revamp the public space around the lake that this gets uh, identity as an energy park or energy producing uh, public space where uh, one function financially supports the other. Uh, there's also, there was also uh, a project that was detailed out to look at how solar roofs can be a more common uh, feature within urban areas. Uh, interestingly, Coimbatore is one of the uh, cities that are chosen within India for the solar mission and smart city mission. So there are national systems, national policies that already support all of these to happen in uh, local areas. So the spatial planning can then here be a tool that connects spatial opportunities to existing governance policies so that one can actually help the other. Um, I think we need to we need to wrap up, huh? Yeah, wrapping up. <laughs> um, so you, all of this testing on the local level was useful to make some key conclusions. One of which was how uh, our exist how can existing stakeholder relationship redefined? Really see that these are the existing connections between uh, 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 the the governments, the enterprises, and the community across these different uh, steps of energy uh, production from production to consumption. And if we add community as a key player within this, we really see that the, that the network dynamic changes. So to implement these change network systems and governance practice, we would then need to intervene mainly in uh, um, uh, this area, which would be the acquisition of land or the uh, uh, production of energy itself which is uh, done in collaboration with the spatial planning body and energy governance body. And I also outlined, I will not go into this now, but 
key specific ways in which we can intervene in different steps of the uh, energy um, production process and on a governance level. Finally, I would conclude with this, which is um, the key takeaway would be the transferability of the methodology. So the process of studying the landscape in terms of its energy potential and simultaneously studying the spatial and the social potential can uh, and, and grading the land based on all of these three criteria together could form uh, the key basis to take any decisions on a regional level. So this methodology is something that could potentially be applied to other um, underrepresented areas in the global south, for example, where social challenges are also quite prominent. Um, that's it. Thank you. And if you want to well, let's, look... Uh... It's so uh, uh, horrible that we cannot applaud, but uh, the chat is really exploding with compliments to you, uh, uh, Pritika. Thank you so much. You. And I'm going to try to say a few of the concerns of people here so that we go a little bit uh, further. First, they are super curious to know what programs you use to produce those wonderful maps. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I I said that uh, you probably used uh, GIS and Adobe yes. Illustrator, but uh... yes, you're right. A <laughs> uh, lot of the, the I think one of the main challenges was actually collection of data, because to map uh, all of the energy uh, sources of across these different types, this information was something that I had to make for the project. So it went from searching for this on Google, getting like these blurred JPEG images, and then georeferencing them using GIS to convert them into data that then you can use to grade, grade this. So it went from yeah, Google image search to GIS to Illustrator. Cool. Another thing that uh, people were asking, which I thought was interesting, is uh, whether your solutions are technically feasible. That's a good question. Um, <laughs> um, technically, technical feasibility, if I understand right, is it about whether if I plan this, will I achieve the energy target type of question? Uh, in that case, uh, the uh, initial targets that I set up that I want to be 60% of the total energy demand in Tamil Nadu has to come from renewables. Setting this target and getting this 52,000 uh, megawatts as what I should aim for, then enables me to break down uh, that out of this 52,000, this much percent can come from wind and this much from solar, this much from biomass, based on how it is already existing. And there was also simultaneous calculations where I had to say, to make one megawatt of wind energy, you need 1,000 meters square of space. I'm saying random numbers here, but this uh, you need this much space to make this much power for each of these four types also helped in the quantification. So I made sure that uh, for the target that I set up, I could achieve um, this target by building in this in, in the specific zones that I showed in the regional. In the, in the land available, right? Uh, because one of the questions is about how much land do you use and did you calculate it? Um, that's a good question. Actually, I, I, I think I calculated energy uh, distribution and uh, megawatts, but I didn't in the final map show how much energy that's actually occupying, which was also quite difficult to calculate because I was trying hard not to take new land. It was always about uh, densifying within existing energy infrastructure, densifying on top of buildings, densifying along roads. So um, spatially, it was hard to calculate, I think. Okay, there are several questions. I'm, uh, guys, I'm sorry, but I will tell them um, because otherwise we will. Um, so Philip is asking about the data. You, you mentioned that you, you had quite a lot of work uh, collecting the data, but he is asking, 
uh, where did you find the data for the uh, uh, energy landscapes? Where uh, was governmental data available? Um, it's actually, I will, there was this really cool software, like simulation software that was set up, I think by government of India, where you could, I will send, I will find it and send it on the chat at some point, but you could actually make energy simulations on it that you could um, see, uh, set your targets and see, say that I want to get to this target by clicking, like selecting solar, wind, this, this, and then it will tell you how to get there, how to distribute it. This was, of course, just numbers, but then this gave me an idea of how to translate it for Tamil Nadu's demands and Tamil Nadu's space. I will find the link and send it. Cool. Um, Angelica is asking about the financial feasibility because I think, I think and uh, I wanted to mention that, that the technical feasibility is one thing. We need to think about uh, the national economic realities. Would you say that this is feasible economically? Yes, <laughs> emphatically, yes. Very emphatic, because, yes. yes. Um, the amount that we spend for fossil fuels, I think, can easily be diverted there. It's, uh, yeah, it's just priority shifting. Very good. Um, so Mauricio is saying that it's, uh, I, think, I, th I think he's saying that uh, that's a good, a good strategy because you're, you're uh, proposing several types of, uh, of energy production and that's good for resilience, right? If we don't put all the eggs in the same basket. Um, let me see, uh, Inti is asking about uh, participation of communities. I think you mentioned it in the presentation, but maybe you could, uh, you could uh, repeat. That's a good question too. Um, I think in the implementation of this project, of any kind of energy project, participation of, with the community would be essential. Um, well, how we can ensure this, not just from participation to get their view, but their participation in the production of it itself could be with this linking uh, government policy of giving subsidies to energy infrastructure and uh, getting the people involved in uh, enabling them to get these subsidies in an easier way. There is, of course, some rewriting of policies to be that is needed. But in my point of view, I think this would be the pathway to do it. There's already a lot that exists as policy. The problem is that there is no pathway to make use of it um, more. So I think participation would, for me, is more important that they get agency in its production itself and not just participation in um, the implementation of somebody else's energy infrastructure on their land. Just okay. a second, I, I was mute, I was mute, yes. Uh, I know there is a lot of questions. Um, uh, look, uh, please read the, the chat, a pretty kind answer if you can by writing. Um, we just uh, shared a link or uh, Ugo shared a link a little bit uh, above in the chat to the Delft repository. That's where you can get um, access to all our student and teachers uh, work. You can download Pritika's uh, work. Uh, we put the link to, to Pritika's work uh, without her permission, but uh, it's public anyway. So, um, and you can download her work from there. Complete, it's everything. I think uh, they put even the presentations there. <laughs> you, can, yeah. you can look at everything. So Ugo just put it again. Pritika is going to, to, to um, uh, try to answer some of the questions, but I can tell you there are lots and lots of compliments and people saying this is amazing work. So congratulations. Thank you. Right? All right, uh, people are getting impatient about the, the, the uh, link. Uh, so the, the, the link for the presence here today i'm going to put it in the in the chat in one second okay this is the link for uh attendance uh please put your name uh and your email there we need to have a little break of three minutes it's called a comfort break as i explained to you before so we can all um you know uh 
do our business and then we uh, come back here in three minutes. Meanwhile, um, Pritika, if you want to answer questions, please be, be free. Um, we are going to resume in three minutes. Hey, Britika. Hey, hey can hey. I ask you something? <laughs> yes. I don't know that if I, I don't know the words exactly how to ask, but uh, I'm continuing my master degree now. And so I'm uh, beginning on my final project. So I feel like I have a lot of things that I read and research about, but I don't know how to start my mapping. So. I, I saw your maps and they are amazing. So do you have any advice of how can, or how do we start the mapping phase? Because um, I have a lot of information, but I don't know how to put it in the maps. Um, yeah. The, <laughs> um, I think it can help for me uh, to start with what you want to map. So what you kind of want to get out of it that if you want to make certain conclusions to link uh, uh, certain things that you see in space to your problem field or your research question, then uh, you know that that's where you want to get at. And then you kind of can work backwards to say, to get there, I need to make a map that shows, um, I'm gonna use this project now, uh, that I wanted to make relations between space and social things. So I knew I had to map energy access. I knew I had to map, um, areas without a complete electricity, or I knew I had to map the land use and energy potential. So I kind of work backwards from what conclusions. Yeah, because sometimes, you know, I make some maps and then I, I feel like it doesn't serve me. So I just de delete the slide or something like that. So. That's, uh, <laughs> if I may, if I may just yeah. intervene, just uh, very quickly. Um, when, when you make the research question, the research question is really the core of your work. Yeah. So if you, if, you, if you really shape your research question in a way that, okay, what do I need to know to answer this question, right? And okay. uh, a lot of uh, universities don't use the research question, but I think it's a mm. very basic. Uh, and from that research question, you can derive sub-research questions. So generally you have you, you need to know a lot of stuff related to the answer because mm -hmm. uh, it's very frustrating to do research um, and then discover that it's useless, right? Like uh, right. I'm not going to this anymore. Yeah. So it's best to have this question at the outset so that you say, okay, what, what are the steps I need to take? And I have to say that we, we kind of hammer this into our students here. So they all like, ah, what's the research question? And uh, everybody is uh, crazy about the research. Yeah, even to know what is your research question is something that is hard. <laughs> yeah. And I think what is super interesting is that the research question is really a question, right? Uh, it mm. needs to have a, a question mark at yeah, the end. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's concerned, it's related, Rawan, to what is it that bothers you? What is it that puzzles you and that mm -hmm. you want to, and sometimes what is it that makes you angry mm -hmm. and that you want to address, right? Uh -huh. So, so 
maybe maybe I can tell you my research question. <laughs> so my my project is about open spaces that we have in East Jerusalem because most of them are like just open spaces that are remarked on the map as a national parks or something like that. Yeah, so, they are. And a lot of them are uh, private ownership. So like a lot of people, like my father, like we have a land, but we can't build on it. So like my research, uh, my research question is about how can we, we the Palestinians in East Jerusalem reclaim our right to the city through these open spaces. Okay. So now I'm having difficulty with making the maps. That well, can help uh, me. you have to to find out what are your sub research questions. So the the yeah. little pieces of information that will help you answer the the main one, isn't it? Guys, we need to go back to because Thank otherwise you. we won't have time. Sorry, Raba. Um, uh, I want to reintroduce uh, Carissa Champlin, my friend from the the School of uh, of Policy and Management technology policy and man management, who is going to talk to us about um, uh, inclusive uh, tools. Uh, and she's going to talk about digital inclusive tools. Carissa, are you there? I can see. Yeah, you. yeah, I'm here, everybody. It's uh, <laughs> nice to be back. And uh, I'm really happy. I'm actually thrilled to follow up uh, after Pritika's uh, beautiful presentation because she really makes my argument quite simple that um, our tools are extremely important, especially visualization tools are so important for communicating knowledge and uh, for uh, yeah shared learning. And so um, picking up on where she left off with her presentation about uh, regional design strategies uh, in India for the energy transition, um, I even saw in the uh, chat, somebody asked the question of, okay, how do we make this a participatory um, sort of planning process? And uh, that's exactly what I want to talk about. Um, so I'll give a very brief uh, presentation on this topic, and then uh, we have the chance to um, experience one of these uh, online participatory tools. So just a second, starting up. There we go. So let's take away all of the beautiful imagery and go back to the basics. Um, the most simple uh, definition of planning came from John Friedman, uh, who defined planning as the practice of linking knowledge to action in the public domain. I think this is such an essential understanding that we take uh, knowledge of all types and then we translate it into interventions uh, on our cities and spaces. But I would even go so far as to say that it's not just about knowledge, it's about gaining insight. So, uh, and how we apply that insight. And insight is different from knowledge and that is the ability to have a clear and deep and sometimes rather sudden understanding of a complicated or complex problem or situation. So you can definitely think about uh, wicked problems, integrated systems uh, in cities and um, trying to plan um, things uh, like a just transition, right? Since uh, for many, many decades uh, throughout the history of planning, um, our insights have been gained through the tools we use. In fact, uh, there's been a long co-evolution between the way we plan and the tools that we adopt in planning. And you can certainly see this in not the best way uh, in the mid 20th century when um, computers really started to have a very strong influence on how we uh, planned our cities. And what we ended up with was uh, designs by, for example, Le Corbusier that uh, was very, uh, let's say technocratic, bottom up, top down, and um, uh, where people were quite enthusiastic about how computers could help us plan the ideal city. Um, this is, a uh, around the 1990s, we started to get a little bit more critical about our tools. We started to realize the limitations of this way of planning, um, this very supply um, oriented way of using our technologies and tools um, to influence our decisions on um, city, city planning. Um, and people started to say, you know, when you have a hammer in your hands, everything starts to look like a nail, right? 
So uh, you, it, uh, people, uh, it started to become quite a critical um, uh, view on uh, the tools that we were developing and lead, letting the um, technology kind of drive this planning process. So the question here is that we really are still debating a lot now. Well, we're not debating it so much. People are pretty much uh, in agreement that um, the need, the planning process should drive um, the tool design and the tools we choose. So now we talk a lot more about building toolkits uh, and oftentimes building toolkits together. Um, and this brings us to the topic of um, co-designing, not only our cities, but the tools that we use to plan our cities in a co-evolutionary uh, planning process. Uh, the beauty of um, co-designing our tools is that uh, tools, uh, you can see a couple of pictures here, like maybe our um, 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 geo-information-based technologies, they um, take a lot of time to develop and they can be rather fixed uh, and um, aren't really open to new ideas or um, things uh, that change, changes that occur in the planning process. Uh, so co-designing these tools uh, can be quite a, an open sort of process that's open to all sorts of knowledge, whether it's experiential coming from citizens, knowledge coming from experts, um, intuition or explicit knowledge, or even computational knowledge. Um, and uh, the openness of these tools really facilitate, and the visual nature of a lot of these planning tools really um, facilitate communication and shared learning, which is an essential part of um, these communicative planning processes. So we talk when we talk about tools these days for planning, we talk a lot about um, structured flexibility, something that can help um, drive this process forward, but in a sort of open way that's open for adaption, uh, adaptation. So coming back to um, Patsy Healy and this idea of a community uh, turn in planning, uh, we uh, yeah, citizen input is extremely important uh, in this communicative planning process. Uh, Participate the, the difference between a collaborative process and participatory being that when we've got a lot of people at the table, include citizens uh, at the table as well. Um, but this is quite challenging. We've very in a few of these challenges already, and there are, uh, you can make an extensive list. I'll add a couple more. Gaining access and building trust with communities, having too many voices at the table to move to making a too chaotic process, um, and keeping citizens engaged. Think about how busy you are in your own lives and how often you uh, fill in a survey about your local area or go to a town hall meeting. Um, and then, of course, this process of bringing knowledge together this is a very challenging um, process. Uh, and lastly, I want to mention the representativeness. So can you really get a good picture of everybody in your city's uh, interests uh, in this process? And can you get them into your models and your tools um, that uh, can you represent their interests, their ideas and their knowledge in those tools? Um, what this comes down to uh, is uh, really uh, having a smart way of integrating citizen knowledge in a planning process, identifying um, three main factors. Where are you in the planning process? Are you at a point where you need to really brainstorm and ideate? Or is it a moment where you need to converge and come together and um, make key decisions to move the for process for forward? Um, what kind of um, data are you needing? Are you needing um, big, uh, big data from tens of thousands of people? Or are you really needing really rich insights from maybe just a small group? And then what uh, is the ideal platform for collecting that type of data for that moment in the process? Uh, is it um, maybe an online survey? Is it maybe an in-person um, in sort of um, interview uh, setting or group conversation? So that's where you can see this nice matrix here uh, of, um, participation uh, versus collaboration and um, diverging uh, the, um, the steps of uh, the planning process where you're opening up to ideas and converging when you're coming together. So here you can see an image where um, we're co-designing uh, a game uh, in order to kind of structure uh, the conversation but uh, and give assumptions about this planning process that then different um, groups could uh, critique and use their own knowledge 
uh, to bring to bring the, their knowledge into that planning process. But if we're at a moment where we really want to open up this planning process, and we need a lot of maybe citizen input, a lot of experiential knowledge of our city, then um, something like a, an online map-based survey can be extremely helpful. And it really helps us to answer the question of um, what's missing from our models. And if we ask this early on um, in kind of this open but structured way, then uh, hopefully we can have a more representative model for our planning and decision making. And with that, I want to um, invite you, I want to first give you an example of a recent study we did where we, about COVID-19, where we wanted to know um, you know, we're creating a lot of policies about uh, COVID to prevent um, disease spread and save lives, of course. <clears throat> but how are these really impacting people's um, behavior on the ground? And so we did a, a survey uh, in The Hague of the Netherlands um, using um, PPGIS, participatory mapping, and we um, ended up with uh, 28,000 responses from over 1,100 citizens. And this gave us a lot of insight into how people are um, um, you know, gaining access to amenities, how they feel about COVID right now, and um, other um, really important insights into our policy making. And with that, uh, I want to invite all of you to um, do an activity to experience uh, um, maybe for the first time a map-based online questionnaire yourselves. Uh, you can either uh, scan this QR code with your phone, or you can, uh, I will put the um, URL in, oh, I'm sorry, I'll put the, did I uh, get rid of that too quickly? I'll put the URL in the chat in just a second, but I'll uh, pull this back up for those of you who were probably wanting to uh, take a picture of the, of the QR code. I lost my slides. Maybe if anybody has a question while I'm pulling this up, you can uh, ask me at the moment. No? Okay, let me share one more time so you can take a picture. So Mauricio is, is asking about more examples of other tools that you could just mention the name maybe? Um, tools for what exactly? What type of participation? For co-design co and participation. No? Uh, hold on, having a bit of a, can you uh, take a picture of the QR code just from uh, the slides like this? Yes, uh, you can leave it like this, I think, right? Yeah, and then uh, in just a minute, for those of you on PCs, I'll copy the link into the chat. Um, there are many different tools uh, for participation. It can be anything from um, just uh, going and doing local surveys, uh, house to house, door to door, um, surveys. It can be um, um, game co-design, which is a lot of the work that I like to do to bring uh, all kinds of knowledge uh, to the table. It can be um, working um, in group facilitated group sessions, maybe standing all around uh, a map table. Um, but it really just depends on, um, yeah, these three factors. Um, the platform, the type of knowledge needed, and the timing and the planning process, and then also, of course, your local context. So what really is suitable for um, the problem at hand and what really suits uh, yeah, where, you, where you are and the tools that you have uh, available. But I, I'd like to say that you can do a lot with uh, very little as well if you can just really stimulate the engagement and if your planners are dedicated to uh, involving citizens throughout the process and not just at the very end to validate their ideas. So um, hopefully everybody's had a chance to take a picture of the QR code. I'm gonna stop sharing so that I can then put the link in the chat. Well, uh, we already shared the link on the chat. Um, Thank you for so me, much for doing that. Yeah, it was easy, easy for me to just click. And then there's a beautiful photograph of Amsterdam. And that's the first yeah. photograph. And oh, when you go in, uh, so I think we're going to give them 10, 15, how long, Roberto, to fill in the search? That's, so uh, the idea, guys, is that you, you fill in the, 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 this um, exercise, right? So uh, 
you can do it and uh, it's really easy to do and very fun, I think. But we will give you 10 minutes to do it now. If you don't finish, uh, then you, you can finish at your own pace later, right? But if you could just try to do it now to see if you have any questions. Yeah, and this is completely anonymous. There is no personal information. Even when you get to the point where we ask you where you live, we don't want your address. We don't want to know exactly where you live. We just, anyone know, who knows transport planning, we need to know the origin destination. So just somewhere around where you live is more than enough. But we're very curious to learn about your COVID experience as well. So Vincent is asking a super nice question, which is about who owns the data after uh, participation? Do citizens have access to data? I would, I would say they should. And um, um, certainly in an open uh, process and cities are becoming more and more um, uh, aware of you know, the value of sharing their data. Um, there's a lot of open repositories that cities are building um, but you have to be very careful with sharing uh, citizen data. So um, this, this survey, this is, we adapted it for you guys to fill in, but when we really did this survey with citizens in The Hague, um, I went through a rigorous process with our data, um, pol um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, basically to check that the, the data was um, safe, the questions were safe and we weren't putting anybody's personal information in jeopardy. So you have to be very, very careful with publishing um, personal data in an open access way. So, so I just want to ask everybody to not, cl not click any, anywhere. You really have to uh, uh, try to zoom in and find the exact, the exact locations. Um, yeah. So yeah. It, it's, it's really, you can really put the, you don't have to put exactly the house where you live in. We are not interested mm -hmm. in that. But, really close to your house, that would be nice. Then I'll, I'll make one more statement and they'll be quiet for you guys to fill it in, but please fill in where you're living. So your place of residence, not where you're from, right? So if you're from uh, Ethiopia studying in Denmark, fill this in for Denmark. Have fun. All right. Well, luck, that was very quick. How did you do it? I, I'm still zooming in. <laughs> uh, you can, um, once you zoom in and you find your location, you have to click on it. Or if you are using your phone, you have to tap. That's how you pin. But then, Carissa, Carissa, just one question. Uh, if you pin, uh, I pinned my location wrong, can I change it? Yeah, you can delete it. There's a delete button. Uh, where's the delete? You might oh, need yeah. to double click on a, on a pin. Yeah, right click. Um, good question. Left click, right click, not sure. You can also search the address on Google. Uh, it gives you the, the location where you are. Yeah, you can also put in your address, yeah. So we are all doing it together now, uh, but if you don't, uh, if you can't finish now, that's fine, you can do it on your own. Yes, and you're encouraged to share. Um, you can send the link or the QR code to friends. We'd love to uh, learn more about people's uh, COVID situations under different regulations around the world. I'm having trouble uh, erasing the wrong uh, thing. Don't know how to do it. Can you click undo, Roberto?
so there are things that I don't have a child, so I don't, I don't, I don't need to do the child. Uh... Yeah, if you if you didn't do an activity, then you don't have to um, put pin that activity. Sure. If you didn't do sports last week, you don't have to mark sports anywhere. Oh, I did. That's. <laughs> I'm very proud. Well done. <laughs> Roberto, I think you may need to reshare the attendance list. Yeah, we already uh, shared the attendance list, guys. Where were you yeah. when we shared it? <laughs> we shared it uh, really in the middle. I'm uh, curious to know where were you and if you are arriving just now, it's a little bit of a problem. It's a good question. Let me see if I can uh, pull up some of the results real time. Working on that for you, uh, Sanjana. Hugo, could you share the, the link again for the... Sure. Oh, okay. We made quite a fuss when we shared the list, so <laughs> it's a little bit. Uh... All right. How are we doing, guys? Ah, they're coming in. Should I uh, screen share to let you see yeah, emerging for those of you who are finished? Yeah, please. All right. It's not going to be super impressive since this is a really a global mapping <laughs> instead of just mapping in one city. But uh, let me see. Here, this is kind of the, the analysis back end that you can see here. Um, on the left, you can see all the different activities that were mapped. And then um, I can zoom in just since this, uh, since we should be in Delft and The Hague, I'll zoom into that area. It looks like there's uh, somebody in Rotterdam filling it in. Is that you, uh, Roberto? No, I live in The Hague. Oh, you live in The Hague, okay. Well, here you can see uh, Rotterdam. This is me, <laughs> probably. Uh, <laughs> you either did a lot this week or there's more than one of you in Rotterdam. I think oh, there more than one, sure. There is also me. <laughs> yeah. There are lots of people in Rotterdam. So here we can see, uh, uh, some shopping activities going on here, um, some uh, cultural uh, activities, taking care of children. Interesting that uh, looks like either a, um, maybe at a daycare facility or in some green space. And then uh, you can do more sophisticated analysis with the, the follow-up questions that, that you guys received when you got the pop-up windows. For example, let's see if we can do some filtering Put on a heat map. And I want to filter on. I don't know if this is going to work so well with only a few data set uh, points in, in one little area. Let's see. We want to know what your main mode of transport was to get to uh, sports. Sorry, I have a question about the mitigation measures. 
uh, it was in the past, yes? Or... Yes, no problem. Go on. Okay. Who, who is talking? I can't see you. It's me, Inti. Ah, Inti, go on. What's, what's your question? About the, the question related with mitigation measures. It's the mitigation measures that government take in the past, took in the past? Uh, Carissa, uh, Inti is asking if the, the question about mitigation is about past actions from the government. So no, what, everything is about your current situation. Actual. Yeah. Actual. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right now for the past seven days. So guys, what you're seeing is a kind of heat map, right? Where things are yeah. happening. Yeah. I'm going to try to fix the heat map. Oh, that's a... It's okay, very yeah. nice. Here. A bit too much blur. All right. Yeah. So let's just, I'm going to zoom out and let's see where we are. Oh, we have people in Scotland, my God. A global mapping of activities, nice. I don't see people in Sao, in Sao Paulo, I see people in Brasilia. Oh, I, I saw that there are people from Paraguay here. Where are you guys? That's amazing. Let's find out. <laughs> yeah. Look, there are people in Brasilia, but not in Sao Paulo. So Paraguay is a landlocked country in, in South America, but they have very big rivers. Asuncion. Yeah. And Luque, Paraguay. Very good. Yeah. And people in Asuncion. I've been to Asuncion. Yeah. So anyway, it would be very interesting to see um, kind of how you guys are feeling about uh, the corona restrictions. And uh, I'm particularly interested in how you responded to how risky you felt the activities were that you did last week. I can tell you for myself, I felt very, very at risk on uh, not so much on the train, but that was one of the higher ones, uh, but also um, teaching. because numbers are getting really, really high in person, obviously. I didn't feel at risk at all, um, partly because I only uh, use the bicycle, so I don't take a public transportation and therefore I didn't get into close contact with anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I have to say that um, in our university, people are wearing masks again, and everybody mm -hmm. is wearing masks, so. Was this the area where Pitika, where you were presenting about? Yeah, Tamil Nadu. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah. Nice. All right, um, we are uh, 10 past, so first of all, I'd like to super thank uh, Carissa for, for uh, coming and demonstrating Mapshoner to us. Uh, I hope you everybody has time and, and patience to, to really pinpoint uh, your activities. Thanks a lot, Carissa. Thanks a lot. Uh, we will... Uh, by the way, uh, let me tell you that we are going to have, uh, if the pandemic allows us, we are going to have um, uh, an edition of the of the summer school. Pritika has has taken part in the summer school before. Uh, it's a, what did you think, Pritika? Yeah, I think it's super cool. It's uh, <laughs> it's the same like this, but you actually get to meet all the people from all these different countries. I yeah. Think when I was there was the biggest, um, I mean, it's the time that I had 
the largest number of people from like different countries in the same room. I think it was more than 40 or something. Yeah, Amazing. I think 40, 43 countries different. Uh, we counted 78 countries among us here. Um, um, so uh, so the summer, this, this autumn school was attended by a, an average of 130 people every, every day, every day that we had a session. Um, of course, uh, the number of people who registered for the school were much higher, like 450, but we know that people register and they don't, they don't come. But we thought that 130 was a really good uh, number, actually. Uh, there were more people in the first one, like I think there were 200 people in the first edition, in the first um, session. Um, but what I wanted to tell you is that we do have... Um, a similar summer school uh, in July, to which of, of course, uh, everybody is welcome to, 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 to come. I have to be a little bit uh, careful because I, I understand that in Africa, when you say, I invite you to come to our summer school, uh, it doesn't mean that we are going to pay <laughs> for you, very sadly, uh, but we are uh, really uh, with our open hearts, willing you uh willing that you you can come and for that we do have a few scholarships that i i'm going to share with you but the the uh, there are two things first the the registration happens only in february so we are a little bit far away uh i'll share the link with you but it's in february uh and then you can see all the scholarships to which you can apply and how to apply it's really nice and the other thing is that we don't know if it's going to happen because of the pandemic. We think it's going to happen uh, because we, we, we are already kind of moving out of the, of the pandemic if people get vaccinated. And I really hope that where you are, uh, you have access to the vaccine. It's, it's, it's a shame and a complete disgrace that the vaccine is not available at the same level to everyone. And I think that's a complete disgrace, but anyway. Um, also, I'd like to thank um, Pritika. I, I just love the things that she does. I just love her maps and, and the thing that, that she does. And I think she really explains super well. I don't know if you guys agree with me, but um, uh, I'm super grateful uh, to her. But now um, I, I'm seeing a few, a few like... Uh, and now I would love to open the floor uh, in the last uh, 10 minutes that we have to discuss. And if you have suggestions or if you have, um, if you want to see something different next time, or maybe you think uh, we didn't cover something that you think is important uh, for us, uh, for Caroline uh, and myself, uh, we are really interested in this concept of spatial justice. And spatial justice has several ways of looking at it, right? But we, we hope that uh, with this uh, school, you could reflect and you had access to knowledge that explains a little bit what it is. So um, what, if anyone has any questions or comments. So uh, we have people who have been in the summer school here, Philip and uh, Ala are, is here. Carolina is here. Lots of people who were who were in our real summer school, and it kind of makes me super happy to see them here back. Um, yeah, somebody was talking. Sorry, go on. Uh, yeah, hello. Hello. Uh, I just wanted to mention about uh, the online mapping that sometimes it seems to be uh, not justice. Because, you know, uh, some old people, vulnerable people, that they, they don't have a computer, for example, mm -hmm. or they just can't use it, uh, they, they don't participate in uh, uh, this co-design. And, and also, mm -hmm. yes, and also I had a case, uh, an occasion when we were participating in a, uh, um, that was a government uh, competition, architecture competition, and they also, they have they did the online mapping, and uh, uh, the most users were pupils. 
-hmm. and they are very small. So it was seen in the map because uh, they all uh, put very bad marks on the school. <laughs> they wrote something stupid about teachers and their classmates and so on. So this data, it was useless for us as uh, designers, for example. Uh -huh. And it was a very big amount of data that was useless. And uh, okay. Okay, they, they, oh, they've done this work, but unfortunately, we couldn't use uh, this massive. You know? Yeah, I, th I think you are right, Mariana, but let's hear from Carissa, what Carissa has to say. I, I think it's such an important point. Um, the, and this is why I also talk a lot about toolkits and co-design and um, bringing different types of knowledge together and find, finding the right tool for the knowledge and the insight that you need to gain uh, at that moment in the planning process. It's very, um, the, we were surprised actually uh, with the skepticism, we were surprised we had a really nice distribution of uh, age in our uh, respondents. Um, you can, what you can do is you can do more targeted advertising, grassroots advertising um, of, and you can also do print out versions and maybe work on a map with, with a smaller group of uh, older people if you really, really need that um, demographic or it's underrepresented. Um, but you're totally right. You, it's, uh, there's a shortcoming of every method. And another thing is uh, oftentimes um, surveys, you can't even get to the people that, they don't get to the people, really the vulnerable people, vulnerable people that you need to understand. So um, yeah, it's a very, very good point. I would say that for, for elderly people and for children, for example, you would need yes. to use the more um, non-digital approach, right? Maps, yes. drawings, but it's possible. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I just want to finish because sometimes uh, the libraries is a very good place to collect the data. You know, mm -hmm. we put a lot, we gather a lot of data from just paper anchors and so on, just from libraries. We have a lot of old people and uh, family people also. <laughs> cool. I see someone you... just published a participation paper, so maybe we should all take a look at that. Congratulations. Yeah, Massimo, Massimo has published uh, a paper. Massimo, would you like to say a few words about it? Yes, I can try. Hello, okay. can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, thank you so much for yeah, this opportunity. I just put the link in the chat if you want to check it out. I just graduated from the University of Twente in the, in the Netherlands. Me too. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I was checking out. Actually, I I worked on these tables that you showed in the pictures. You know, the the mapping tables. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I I also worked on them, so it was very nice to see. But anyway, um, yeah, check the paper if you want, and I will be very glad. And thanks, thank you all for these uh, wonderful sessions. Really. Thank you. Thanks uh, a lot. Massimo's Massimo's paper is downloadable. Uh, it's open source, so anyone can download it, right? Any other uh, questions or remarks? Um, yes, hi. I wanted to say hi. something. Hi. Yeah, so... Beautiful name. Oh, I love this name. <laughs> Thank you. I know it's very common in Brazil, but where yeah. I come from, it's <laughs> extremely rare. So, uh, <laughs> but um, um, I had a comment about the, uh, you asked if, if one of us, if we could wanted to say something about the content of the course. First of all, yes. thank you. Um, and um, I am at TU Berlin and I'm doing my master's uh, thesis. Good night. Good night. My, my daughter is here. <laughs> she just wants to say hi. Ciao. Hi. Good night. <laughs> She's going to bed, so <laughs> sorry. Um, so um, I'm doing my master's thesis on uh, social justice and um, collective land rights. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why I was interested. I actually got to know about your uh, program from my school. And I am um, very interested in the concept of justice and how we can do this. So um, I've been doing some reading about justice and all. My uh, observation or my comment about the content of the course is that uh, the course especially focused on spatial justice. And I was wondering uh, at the beginning of the course, if it would be possible to place spatial justice in the discourse of the entire justice discourse. As in, mm -hmm. I'm trying to say that justice, the concept of justice is as old as uh, human civilization, but um, the theory of justice or the writing of justice 
uh, has a time progression, you know, and generally, uh, at least as far as I know, uh, from the 1970s or with the book of uh, David Harvey, 1972 book of David Harvey, and just before that, John Rawls, 1970 book, um, a lot of theories of justice uh, came into uh, discussion or discourse. So I was just, um, I felt like the Edwards was uh, the this, this special justice discourse. If it could be placed in the spectrum, uh, then uh, visually maybe even just uh -huh. a slide or two slides that would uh, at least for me it would have been a bit more I, I read I knew about the, the, this as in not a lot but I knew about this and it really helped me to talk about various things but I think the uh, the discourse of the justice can be represented a bit more uh, rather than just this I mean of course okay. it's an art school that was just my well, I think it's a, an excellent um, an excellent uh, suggestion we will try to do that in the future Meanwhile, I would really recommend uh, the idea, I'm uh, writing it down for you, of justice by Amartya Sen. Um, yes, I'm a Bengali. I, I, that is the first book that I read. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I am from Bengal. So, um, uh, yeah, also almost the same city. So, yeah. Yes, thank you I so much. Say, I have to say that uh, because he's an economist, I think he has more clarity of conceptualization than other other uh, people, right? Uh, maybe Caroline would uh, would you, would you like to say something? If Caroline is still, I don't know if she's there. Yeah, she is. Yeah, I can see. I'm, I'm here. I'm here. Um, no, I, I think it's a it's a valuable suggestion that, that we can uh, take on board. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how to add to it, Roberto. <laughs> um, <laughs> well. Um, uh, look, uh, I think we, we kind of uh, tried to focus on the most updated version of, uh, of justice, right? And we jumped um, a Marxist conception of justice, which are important for us to, uh, to understand. So how Marx, uh, Karl Marx uh, understood uh, justice which reflects on how Soja and Harvey understand ju uh, justice because they're both Marxists, by the way. And um, the way that we, uh, so I, I, I have to make a self, self uh, kind of correction, but the way we present justice is as if everybody agreed that we need justice, but that's not the case, right? What we actually have in the world are forces um, of production and consumption. So we have capitalism really sometimes um, inhibiting uh, justice. Um, and for that, for, to, to discuss that more in depth and to understand the conflict, we would need to talk about Marx and we would uh, need to explore it a little bit further. Um, the idea of uh, participation, uh, participatory planning, but for example, is a very contested um, uh, idea because not everybody can participate. Um, people suffer from structural disadvantages. In, in some places, women cannot speak. Uh, in some places, children don't have access to things or workers are oppressed. Uh, so uh, we don't want to give you the impression that, you know, participation is super easy and that everybody agrees with it. But that's the way that we found of kind of, okay, let's plant this little seed in your minds. And uh, also because I have to, oh, sorry, I missed the, uh, Nayara, Nayara. Uh, we have to see that uh, people in this room, they come from very different backgrounds and have very different understandings and different education. So we wanted to give like a very basic uh, ideas, right? So that we can build upon. So those of you who are, um, yeah, like uh, more experienced and are reading more things about it, you will be able to build upon it. But, um, uh, I think it's very important to recognize that there is a lot of injustice and that uh, a participation doesn't solve all the problems. Uh, and sometimes participation 
it's kind of impossible even, right? As I, I'm sure some of you will testify. Roberto, can, can I add to, to um, what you just said? Mm -hmm. And starting from this kind of ec economic um, uh, view and, and the Marxist uh, perspective, I think today if you want to understand more about um, justice and injustices, um, that I think it, it's worth looking at uh, the concept of intersectionality in spatial planning as really bringing to the fore how, how different groups of people with very different backgrounds, very different sort of um, experiences are um, experiencing urban injustices and how we can try to include that in our planning practice. And someone who's been writing uh, uh, interest, in an interesting way about it is uh, Vanessa Castambroto from the University of Sheffield. I'll put her name in the chat. Guy, guys, I, I think that is the way forward. Yeah, I, I just remember that um, uh, Google is your friend, right? So uh, we can't give you all the papers, but if you Google Vanessa, for example, it's full of papers that you can download. And I really would uh, suggest that you read them. Any other uh, suggestion or comment? This is an open floor, right? So everybody can speak. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> um, yes, it's like kind of an unrelated oh. comment. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, since we're all um, interested in the same topics and um, uh, we all come from similar backgrounds, sim similar educational backgrounds, if there's a way for us to connect and network after this is over, if we can uh, get each other's emails or something. I know I would be interested in something like that. I'm not sure if anyone else would be, but I'd love to get to know all of you and that's an, an amazing idea. Uh, we are going to see all the attendance lists because we cannot share all the emails, but we will share the emails of people who attended. And uh, if there is anybody who doesn't want it, please let me know and I can take your name out, no problem. But um, uh, in principle, we will just share the name, the email and the school where the person is uh, attending. So it's not very personal information. And you could you could uh, potentially uh, do something together, uh, right? Is that is that a good idea, Nadine? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, uh, LinkedIn. Uh, Edgar is saying. Uh, so we have uh, we have uh, oh we could have a we could have a, a a LinkedIn group. Very good idea. I will do it, and I will share it with you. Uh, we have a Facebook, uh, but I don't really want to tell people to go to Facebook because Facebook is kind of evil. But uh, we do have um, um, a group on Facebook called Spatial Planning and Strategy. Please join it. Um, Caroline, Carissa, and myself, we have uh, Twitter accounts. I, I don't know if Hugo has a Twitter. Hugo, do you have a Twitter account? Uh, I don't know, but yes, um, I do, but I don't really use it so much to post okay. stuff. <laughs> yeah. Twitter is for old people. There's a there's a suggestion by. No, uh, that's really good. Papa Harun. Sorry, to well, uh, there is a there is a suggestion of the LinkedIn group. I think that's excellent. I will do it and I will share it with you. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Any other uh, comments or questions? Because we need to finish. Are there questions about the 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 final uh, deliver deliverable? So the 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 homework you need to do. Did you have a look at it? Yeah. So uh, yeah. Uh, are there any questions about it? If you have any problems uh, doing uh, the three minute or five minute um, five minute uh, film with your phone. Uh, you can always write a text instead, right? So I think everybody can write a text. The text should be 1,000 uh, words. That's two pages. 
so not too much. And otherwise, uh, we will wait for your films and your texts. Uh, there is a way to upload them. Uh, by the way, I didn't tell you how to label the thing. So if you go to the folder in, um, in, the, um, in the Google Drive, there is a folder that you can access. And then it's uh, written assignment. And there are the instructions for the assignment. And I, said, I, I put there how to label it. So I have to put your name and the name of the city. So we know who you are, right? Otherwise, we are going to receive your, your uh, film and we don't know who it belongs to. Uh, what's the deadline? It's in the uh, document that I shared with everyone. Uh, I think it's in January, but really there is a lot of time, a, a few weeks, and 24th of January, thanks. So um, there is a lot of time for you to do it. Uh, and uh, I think uh, we are asking very little, uh, well, not very little, but I think it's fair what we are asking. And in that case, um, those who attended the, the lectures and deliver, then we are going to give you a, a certificate after the 24th of January, we are going to give you a, a certificate, okay? Roberto, can I interrupt just quickly? Yes. Um, we wanted to, uh, if, offer the opportunity if anybody, if a small group, it has to be a small group, is particularly interested in using Mapsionaire for the assignment. Um, it does need to be um, a, a topic or an investigation related to COVID in order to use our license. Um, but if there are a few of you who would like to do some data collection uh, with the tool, uh, we can arrange that. So we might have to be a bit selective if a lot of people ask. Um, but there is that opportunity that we'd really like to extend uh, to you. Uh, can you put your, your email in the chat, Carissa? So, so. Absolutely. Yeah. Another I have thing, a question. Yeah, just, just before, before your question, um, one thing that is super important is that we cannot accept uh, films where we cannot see your face, at least some part of the, of the film, right? Uh, to be honest, we are actually more interested in you than anything else. We want to know your story and you can tell your story related to the problem uh, in your city, where you live, how, how you experience it, if you, have problem, if you have personal problems with it and so on. So it's really about you uh, and the city. So thanks so much. Uh, yes, who was uh, speaking? I was just, I wanted to ask if, for example, I live in the UK now, but I've just been living here from October last year. So when I'm responding to this assignment, do I write relative to Dar es Salaam where I spent, you know, a longer time, or do I write to where I am now? Carissa, uh, oh, uh, uh, the, I think the question is for me. Um, I don't know, because you need to show some, some scenes of Dar es Salaam, so you can't go there now. I will leave it to you, Edgar, whatever you decide. If you want to do it on, on London, that's also fine. And if you want to do it about uh, Dar es Salaam, maybe you can just use, for, you know, film the photograph and, and say something about the problem. That's both are, are possible. All right. Okay, thank you. Okay, guys, uh, if there are no more questions, um, I want to thank again Carissa, Caroline, Ugo was uh, very good. We should all thank Ugo, he's great. Um, and uh, he, he plays the guitar, we didn't hear him play guitar, but that's fine. Um, and I really enjoyed the summer school, the autumn school, I keep calling it summer school. And I hope we will uh, keep in touch. I'll share the emails and do the LinkedIn and otherwise I will see you sometime, all right? Thanks a lot, guys. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank, you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.